My name's Finn Stuckey. That's me where I work in my spare bedroom. Uh, I have been doing flex development, so that's, um, that's a type of uh, flash technology. It's, it's a, I think of it as an extension of web development. I was originally a web developer. A few projects that I worked on, one uh, is called Sim Capture. It's for a company called Beeline Medical. I'm pretty sure, uh, so this was based out of DC. I was in DC for a while. Um, but I'm pretty sure they uh, have some software at Vanderbilt somewhere. Um, yeah, so, uh, so I worked on this. It integrates with a simulator. So basically the simulator um, has vital signs and it's dying. This uh, connects to the simulator um, and gets all the data from it, also records video. So I worked on the front end for that. It's not a, it's not a normal kind of web page thing. It's very, uh, it's very application-y, right? This is another one um, called Spatial Key. Uh, ended up, a screenshot from it ended up on Computer World, which was really cool. Um, it's geospatial data analysis. So a lot of police departments use it. Um, some other organizations with a lot of data that has a geospatial component. So this is like um, business intelligence reporting for your geospatial data. Also not a normal web app kind of uh, an extension. Uh, a side project I've been working on lately is called Audio Spike. Just uh, some basic audio editing on the web. Uh, so that's my background. A little bit about um, what I'm trying to fit in today. Uh, a few words on design. So normally a larger portion of this session is on design, but I'm gonna cut that out for time because we wanna talk about some development process at the end. Um, why create good code and design uh, and the art of application architecture. So a lot of the sessions um, that I see at conferences are either um, technical, they're development focused, they have a lot of code, or they're design which seem to be more um, more touchy-feely, kind of ethereal, ethereal or something. Um, so I wanted to kind of cross those. I wanted to talk more uh, conceptually about code. So this is um, what that is. I'm gonna try to give maybe 20, 25 minutes to this and then 15 or 20 to development process. How many people came here today with spe like specific questions or thoughts on development process? All right, cool. So I'm gonna have time for that. I have, it's only one slide, so I won't talk about it a lot, but hopefully we can, uh, you know, sort of make it, make it a discussion. Uh, so a few words on design. I think this is really important and overlooked. This to me is design. This is interaction design, not necessarily graphics design. So if you don't have a process like this where you're organizing what's going to happen where, um, and it's just, black and white, just, just pencil or paper, then I think you're missing an important step. Um, a lot of the applications I build are, are stateless. So it's not one page to another. There's, there's a dozen things going on. They each sort of have their own state. So this is very important to understand how you're going to um, design that interaction that the user's gonna have to simplify it. And simplification, is something I revisit through this presentation, but just as much in design as in code, um, simplicity is incredibly important. Feel good to feel free to you know ask questions. I'll, I'm looking out every now and then um, as we go. So, <laughs> why good is better? Um, a lot of the people, a lot of the clients and managers, project managers I deal with feel like making the code better is sort of good for the developers but it's just taking up time for them, right? They want more features in it. So this is the typical argument. Well, we need to clean up the code because there'll be less bugs, there'll be better performance. Let's assume the whole section was on this. Um, but what it really is about is um, something that's been called lately technical debt. Um, how many people here are familiar with the term technical debt? Okay, so um, technical debt in a summary, this is my summary, is that it's basically harder to write new features on bad code. So the more bad code that you leave behind, the slower your pace is as you try to develop more. Um, these charts aren't mine. Uh, 
down here where it got cut off, I actually had a good citation of who they were, but it got cut off. Oh, uh, Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland, it's on mine. Okay, so, so here's where you start with a project. You sort of scope it out, you end up with an always idealized and overly simplistic view of the work completed over time. So even if you're really good at this, it's sort of a straight line, um, there's where we're headed. What happens as you start developing, well, the actual rate at some point um, is, is a little bit slower. So your pace is slower than you wanted it to be. Imagine that. And pressure at some point is brought to bear. We're not going to hit our target. We're not going to hit our release date. Um, we need to, what you really should be doing is pulling out features. But what really happens is um, clients or managers start bargaining. You know, can we, can we really do this sprint in one week instead of two? Well, technically, yeah, but it's going to be half broken. It's going to be bad. So quality begins to suffer. It's what happens. Um, so this area in between where you should have been with good code at a good steady pace and where you rushed to get to is where the bad code comes in. That's technical debt. So that's fine for, th for that release. I mean, you could go back and clean it up later or whatever. It works. It, it passes all the you know, tests or whatever. Um, worse on the next release, because that bad code is there, your pace is slower. So your estimate, say your first, you know, sprint or release was a month, and you're planning the next one for the next month, does that make sense? Well, you gained technical debt in the first month, so your next release might actually take two, because you're building on top of that bad code, and you need to, the reason it's called debt is you get it now, but you need to pay it back later. And the payback is time to reassess the code. And um, for developers, what we're learning when we code is, um, is the business process or the, the human process of what the application should be. And our understanding of that is changing as we're building the application. So um, we don't fully understand it the first go. But, oh, now we get it after that release. We need to update the code to reflect our new understanding of it. Because as we understand the process, we can simplify it in the code. Um, so, so that's technical debt. What happens if you don't clean it up is on the next release, well, it really should have been two months. But you hit that one month again, it's, it's worse. And it's slowing down your process every time. Uh, and eventually, it gets to a point called design death where it's faster to rewrite it from scratch than it is to um, keep adding features as is. Because now you've gained so much, um, so much technical debt, bad code, just spaghetti code in there, it's impossible to understand it. But all your bug fixes are in that code. <laughs> um, so nobody wants to touch it. So to build that one new feature that used to be like a day is now like a month because you're going to break 15 things when you change that code. And God forbid, whoever owns it goes away. Uh, so it creates legacy code, also creates new employees, because you have to add more people to, to cope with the longer timeline that's happening. Management doesn't realize this, because um, they, they don't have the, the visibility to see, to understand what's going on there. Um, so for anyone not um, involved in code, this is what, this is what technical debt is. Uh, if I could think of any visual for technical debt, this is, this is it. Yeah. Um, so this, is a this actually exists. I think it's in India somewhere. Uh, and all the people wired their own um, electricity and telephone connections. They just stole it off the main line. Um, and this actually works. I mean, this is functioning. It's not broken. Everybody gets their electricity and their telephone. But um, you know, if you have to fix something in there or add something to it, you can imagine it's, it's a process, right? So um, with that in mind, uh, I have to think about my philosophy for coding. Um, when I first started coding, I was introduced to this concept a few times. Uh, bad coding philosophy, I call it. 
whatever, it's all opinion. But bad coding philosophy, there are a thousand ways to code it, and all of them are right, right? It works, it's good. Um, well, that's not a good way to code it, the, in my opinion. That is not acceptable, it's bad. So out of the thousand ways, that's not a right one. So I can accept that. Um, better philosophy, there's only one way to code it. It exists somehow in a perfect world. It'd probably take a million years to, to find the exact <laughs> perfect right way to do it. There is. It exists. You should strive for it. So there's one way to code it. You'll never know how. So don't, don't waste cycles trying to get it perfect, but try to make it better, right? So um, that's why. So here's um, my opinions on the art of architecture. What does it feel like to write good code? All right. So um, the other takeaway for me is that code is an abstraction of your thought process. Um, so it takes a while to uh, get comfortable enough with code to, to think of it this way in any language. Um, basically, assembly is machine code. That is not an abstraction of your process. And it's, it's basically the computer process. Everything else is for your benefit. It's not for the computer's benefit. So don't write code for the computer. Write it for you to understand. Um, Object-oriented specifically is a very human thought process. Uh, if you uh, think about our language or uh, hear theories about our language, it's very object-oriented. Things that we abstract away, um, like, uh, like I'm giving this presentation to you. Well, there's nothing physical that I'm giving to you, but that is the abstraction. So object-oriented is the same way, except uh, computers can interpret it. So um, those concepts are made to make sense to us. It's actually quite hard for the computer to interpret it. Um, so the whole idea is if you don't understand the, the program, that represents a problem because it's for you to understand. You need to separate it out in ways that make sense to you. Um, all right, dream and code. This is a bit of an abstract one too. I put these up front just to get them out of the way. Um, so it's an extension of this. Uh, code should be a human thought process. If it is a human thought process, it should make sense almost subconsciously, right? So you're getting more benefit out of that because um, it's, it's, it makes more inherent sense to you. If it takes a very cognitive process to recognize what's going on, you know, if this and then that, and a lot of rules in there, um, it's, it probably could be abstracted better. So obviously if then needs to exist in there, but it should, um, I don't use it a whole lot. So it, a lot of it should be in object-oriented principles. Uh, okay. Uh, why, so why I put this code in there is I actually have had a few, occur uh, more than a few where I sort of fall asleep with a problem. Um, I wake up and I feel good about a solution about it. And I know that I was half awake thinking about it. I remember being half awake thinking about it. But in that state, I can't read the clock. I can't read my alarm clock and know what time it is. Because that, I guess, to me, is a cognitive process to understand the letter. But I can sit there and think about the ideas of this application. This area is segmented off here. It, it interlates with this area there. They're sort of concepts. And those concepts um, translate directly to object-oriented code. Um, okay, so I hear this a lot too. Think outside the box. Um, I've got a little video for it. So this is bad thinking outside the box to me.
So, um, so the takeaway for this to me is that they started out trying to think outside the box. They out thought outside the box each other, right? They had a little thinking outside the box contest and they both landed on the agreement that they should build um, a rocket with lasers and a comfy chair. <laughs> which you will not believe how often this happens in the development process be because what you don't need really is a rocket with lasers and a comfortable chair. <laughs> Somehow you end up there. <laughs> so I think, uh, code, I think code is art. I've heard this a lot, I agree. I think it's art because you create beauty. Um, beauty in code is, is something that's important to me, but it, it doesn't require creative thinking, right? So um, that's my takeaway. Um, so don't build a rocket powered by ideas with huge wings and lasers and comfortable chairs. If you feel yourself doing that, you're going in the opposite direction than you want. You should be trying to simplify and, uh, and reduce. Um, here's another. Uh, good code should not make you feel smart. So it shouldn't make you feel smart in the sense that these two people were being smarter than the other one, right? Good code is often so simple and obvious that you kind of feel stupid you didn't think of it the first time through. Um, usually the first time through, you're gaining an understanding of the process you're trying to create with the code. And um, when you don't understand something, you tend to overcomplicate it. Um, so you overcomplicate the process in code. When you understand it better, you go back through and you're like, oh, what an idiot. I could have just done this three lines. Would have been fine. I have this whole class for it. Uh, so simplification is always good. Uh, don't overcomplicate it. There it is. Uh, but, of course, it is hard to code. You should still be allowed to be proud of the beauty you're creating. So I think simplification is very beautiful in code. Be proud of that. That's a hard thing to do. Um, that's the smart thing to do. So it's good. Uh, so we've been talking about this some beauty in code. To me, uh, what's beautiful in, in code? So three um, items that I constantly revisit. Simplicity, we talked about separation and singularity. So I, so I kind of cheated. For some reason, I had two S's and I wanted a third one, uh, so singularity. But I think separation and singularity are um, kind of like a yin and yang process. It's, it's the process that you're going through to create simplicity, which is, which is beauty defined in code to me. Um, so separation is the process of taking um, concerns and separating them out. So one class does two things, that's probably not good. Uh, we could make them separate classes. But then you end up with duplicate code. You need the same function in both. So you need to uh, be sure that you don't have duplicate code, uh, one place for one type of code. And through this process of separating things out, if something's doing two or more things, it really should only be doing one separate it out, you end up with duplicate code, you need to somehow create a utility or a common place for this code. Um, through this process, you're creating a more simplistic and object-oriented program. Um, and then when you need something, obviously you know UI and things have to do more than one thing, but it should be a combination of other classes and utilities that are um, doing that functionality for you. So it should, something that does more than one should be a combination of other things. So, um, beautiful code represents an idea, and the underlying logic exists only to support that idea. To me, the core ideas are in interfaces. Um, so this is the concept, and I start out with interfaces. Here's my idea of it now. Those are sort of markers for me and other people that are working on it to get an idea of how this is gonna run. And then we create logic to support the interface, to support that idea and we run into a change of perspective, right? Oh, this isn't gonna work. Need to change the interface, <coughs> and that interface is a marker of the changes in our understanding of the process. Um, and that works very, very well. Uh, so don't end up with that. That's bad. That'll, that's 
technical debt to the spaghetti code. Um, so this is an example to me of, uh, of simplicity. I think I'm going to run through it. Um, but basics are when I first approached this interface, I thought it was a, a bad idea. I didn't like this rectangle. So this is specific to my language. But um, I didn't like the interface. But later on, I found that it let me do something that would have been impossible without this interface. And I thought, if they, if they were smart enough to predict that or to think about it ahead of time, then why didn't they create this functionality themselves? Because they don't really use that, that rectangle except for in one place. And uh, the resolution I ended up on, which is, was sort of a breakthrough to me, um, was that they didn't anticipate it. it was, this was the natural state of the way that concept needed to be defined. It needed to be defined for it to work that way in one place, which I originally thought was a mistake. But then it turned out I really needed that rectangle definition to use this correctly. It, was, it wasn't um, someone being a genius. It was the natural form of how this should be represented. OK, so create systems, not code. Um, key distinction for me are systems are predictable and code, it, code is not. So predictable, simple system. Uh, Roman numeral problem. Basically, if you uh, create a Roman numeral um, processor, so uh, from decimal into Roman numerals and from Roman numerals into decimal, it's very easy to create this system um, with, with code, with spaghetti code. So if the first one's this, then do that. And th but you run into issues um, with special cases. And if you work toward creating a system, the code's much less. It works much better for more cases. So um, this is an exercise I, I recommend trying out. Um, if, and think about, are you creating code or are you creating a system? Yeah. OK, so uh, application data flow. This is very important for me. I deal with um, applications that are running on the client. So Flash is using this. The the client CPU, it's got a lot of stuff going on. But it also needs to communicate with the server. And this communication um, is often botched um, by people who don't use this a lot, use this kind of workflow a lot. So uh, if you want to get a feel for this, an exercise I recommend is try writing an MP3 player on really, if you want to use a Java client or .NET or whatever, it's the same. Um, Writing an MP3 player, if you think of the, the APIs for making the MP3 play or pause or stop, and then how that integrates with the UI, you're going to end up with a very similar process with dealing with server calls and how that integrates with the UI. And this will keep you from botching you know, like a dozen server actual projects while you write this MP3 player a dozen times, and you get better each time. Um, basically, the idea is you can't. So you can't tell the MP3 to play and then change the play button. That's what you're going to do the first time off, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to mess you up real bad. What you have to do is tell the MP3 to play, listen for the MP3 APIs to tell you, hey, I'm playing, and then on that listener or on that event or whatever the language has set up for that, then you are only doing UI updates from what the MP3 APIs are telling you it did. Um, and then you eliminate inconsistency problems where, well, the MP3 was playing, and um, then the server connection cut out, and it actually stopped, but the UI still thinks it's playing, and things like that. Um, so this is an exercise, you know, try on your own. So don't, don't do this, right? Don't say, hey, add it to the server, and then add it to my client. That's what's happening there because you aren't guaranteed that the server got it. Here, you say, OK, add it to the server. Wait for the server to tell me everything's OK. When everything's OK, go ahead and add it to the client's state, right? so that the client always matches what the server says. Same thing uh, in MP3, right? Don't do this. Um, you listen for the MP3 player to tell you, hey, I'm playing, then update the label. Right, make about a dozen. It's a good process. Uh, so 
another reason this is important is the history of applications. There's always going back and there's sort of a cycle in theory going from heavy client to small client. So heavy client or heavy, uh, let's say thin client, right, heavy on the server was back in like mainframe days. You have a terminal, it does nothing but connect to the server. Server does all the processing, terminal just shows you text. Um, then you end up with thick client, right? You have a PC, no servers, everything's on the PC, it's right there. Then you have um, server, which is the web browser now. Everything's on the server, web browser just displays it to you, right? Just rendering thin. Everything's happening on the client. So um, theory is, you know, we should be moving back toward thick client. This is a cycle. Hey, all the software's on the client. That's sort of the space I work on with rich internet apps. A lot of processing's happening on the client side. It could be entirely client side. But we end up in this weird, actually very useful space where applications couldn't happen otherwise, where it's almost equally balanced between the two, which is why I, I really like working there. I think it's, it's awesome. Um, but it ends up with you know, these state problems and communication problems between logic that's on the server and logic that's on the client. There's this back and forth communication that has to happen. So that's why that process is very important. Um, Okay, maybe maybe a couple minutes for this. Uh, coder's block, um, you know, I, I don't know in IT education the development process, but in, uh, you know, in dealing directly with clients, um, the focus is always on the features and there's always a deadline, right? And if you let that deadline loom over your head, um, then you're just staring at something knowing that you can't figure it out in time and going, you're freaking out, right? Um, that's actually putting a block in place for you not to be able to figure it out. That deadline is, the pressure of that is a mental block. It's like writer's block, but for code. So um, to understand this, I recommend checking out the candle problem. This is a well-known psychological um, experiment. How many people are familiar by chance with the candle problem? Okay. so. Um, so the candle problem is basically, I don't know why they don't teach this in like <laughs> masters of business classes. Um, extrinsic motivators have a negative effect on output for um, process that requires cognitive ability. So um, if you're working in a factory, you're just screwing that one bolt on. Extrinsic motivators, awesome, right? We'll give you a bonus at the end of the day if you get past 200, right? Double the output or something, it's great. For it. So we have a factory management system, we have an industrial management system. They apply the same thing to coding, right? Uh, we tell them, well, the scope's really like two weeks for this feature. Well, you know, if I, what if we give you a $500 bonus if you get it done in one week? Uh, well, they're gonna, they're gonna slow me down, basically, is what this is saying. Uh, so. Extrinsic motivators is basically everything external to my internal thought process. If I don't want to inherently um, do it myself, then it's an extrinsic motivator. Uh, and all of it basically <laughs> slows me down, has a negative effect on my output. Um, and this is provable in psychology, so look it up. I'm not just making it up. Um, the experiment is the candle problem. What they do is they have these three items, um, matches, a box, full of, a box full of packs and a candle. And they uh, tell one group, we're just timing you for norm, right? Just solve it. Uh, we're gonna get the average time and, and let us know when you're done. And they tell the other group, uh, group B, um, so we're, we're timing you and we're seeing how fast you can do it. We're gonna give you $20 for the experiment if you do it in, um, 30 minutes or less, we're gonna give you $10 if you do it in 15 minutes or less. You know, whatever the circumstances are, they set it up a lot of different ways. Um, and what happens is, uh, experimentally, and this has been duplicated a lot, the um, test for norm team, measurably faster than the test for speed team. So by telling them, you would um, motivate them to do it faster, you slowed them down. <laughs> because they knew that they were on a timeline, they had that pressure, 
and that pressure put in a block to do the cognitive process that it takes to solve this problem, right? Only applies to cognitive um, processes. What it is is they see three items, right? They don't see the box because the box is just there to contain the, the tax. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a sort of uh, set up mind, mindset, right? Uh, so that's the only way you perceive the box. And it takes, it takes a cognitive process to perceive the box in any other way because that's the way it's, it's given to you. Um, and the only solution is to tack the box to the wall. What they have to do is um, make the can light the candle on above the desk without it dripping on the desk, right? So they have a wall, they have a desk, they have these items. You need to, the candle can't be on the desk. It needs to be, um, it, it can't be sitting on the desk and it can't drip on the desk. So um, lots of tries are like melting the candle onto the wall, you know, stick it on there. It takes a cognitive process to realize, hey, I could use the box. Um, so what happens when you take the tax out of the box, you give them these four items, solvable. And, and the test for norm solves it um, slower than the test for speed, right? Because you see the four items, you immediately go, hey, here's a box, right? The cognitive process isn't required. Um, but when you put this, this um, problem requires a cognitive process, apply an extrinsic motivator, it goes slower. And code requires a cognitive process. So carrot and stick, not so good. Um, the way that I cope with this, um, obviously deadlines are real. They need to exist. Um, I have to meet them. But I tend to put my deliverables um, a few hours into the morning. And what I do is I uh, worry about deadlines in the morning to get them out of the way, get stuff done. I have that two hours to know. Even if it's not perfect, I can just rig it up. I can make it work. I can hack it together in that two hours. Even if it's not exactly what they wanted, I can deliver something in that two hours. And I can spend um, the rest of the day actually solving the problem in a relaxed state like I need to be. Um, and it's just taking, even if it's not something enjoyable to do or to solve, you just take the problem for what it is, um, figure out the best way to, to solve it without the added pressure that's creating a mental block for you. Okay, question and, and answer on that section and then I have a slide for um, development process. Any questions there? No? Okay. So, um, so development process is a sort of loose term, but here are some tools and processes um, that I apply to it. And uh, so I'll start out with this. The first to me, um, this is sort of going in order of magnitude, right? The first applies if you're working by yourself, the first few, and then it applies more and more as you add more people to the team. Uh, first, simplicity, separation, and singularity. Basically, by um, using this process and having simplistic code, you're creating code that not only you can understand, because you've spent months and months working with the problem, but other people can approach it. And um, even, you know, it's not like immediate, but it makes sense as you look through it. Um, there's not giant blocks of just crap, right? So this process makes it easier to work to the together because other people can come up to speed just through looking at the code. Code is sort of a roadmap of the process. Um, then you get to library projects. Uh, obviously, if you have code that's used in two applications, you can sort of separate it out. That's a larger separation. Um, so then, you know, you work on the library project. You know, we need this functionality to use over here. I'm going to work on this application piece uh, that needs to tie to it later, and we're going to meet in the middle in two days or whatever, right? So that's often a process on smaller teams. Um, then application architecture. This is another way of separate, all of these ways to work on teams are kind of ways to separate out things. Because then you can work on this concern, I can work on this concern. We're not writing over each other's code, everything's handy. So application architecture is important for this workflow. Um, model view controller, um, model view, view model, the new, well, it's not new, but the concept used in rich client architecture a lot. Um, so basically, you work on the view, you know, make it look better. I'll work on the controller, 
integrate it with the server, um, and we can work on separate code bases, but we're both being productive, not writing over each other's code. So these, these code pieces, important not only for the program, but important for workflow as well. Um, and then source control, obviously. Are you guys on source control here? No? Oh man, need to get on some source control. Um, so SVN is common. Uh, Git or JIT, I say Git, I don't know, um, is a new, it's not entirely new, but uh, basically Linus Torval wrote this. It's pretty awesome if you're if you can deal with command line. Um, I recommend checking out Git for your source control. It's it's quite extraordinary. Um, so source control can handle even if you're working on the same file, it can handle merges for you. And most cases, the merges work just fine. It deals with it line by line. Um, so it basically says delete these two lines, add this line here, and the only occurrence that runs into trouble is where you both edited the same line, and then it'll just tell you, whoa, conflict happened, I don't know what to do with this line, and tell me what to do with it, and everything's good. So that, that to me, is the big um, tool for, for integrating lots of developers on a team with the same code base. Um, and then uh, test-driven development, um, TDD is test-driven, BDD is behavior driven. So test driven is integrating a single unit of code that, um, so it's, um, it's testing a single unit of code. You're basically, you have code that's not UI, it's just meant to call these APIs and exercise the other code. When you put these inputs in, you get this output out. What about these inputs? You're, you're testing all the different cases for this function or this utility or whatever you're testing being sure that the outputs are verified. And by doing that, you're validating that that code works the way um, it's, it's been specified to. And that's actually very important. An important part of test-driven is um, writing your tests before you code. Because when, when you write them after you code, you write them specifically to validate the code you've written. They always work, which is fine, keeps that code in place. But when you write them beforehand, um, you're basically writing the spec with the test, and then when you write the code, um, you you might have written the you might be writing the code, um, and the tests fail. So there's more cases. You're basically debugging before you code is what happens. So take that debugging process that's very iterative, takes that extra cycles afterwards, and you place it beforehand, so that when you write the code, it's debugged ahead of time because any bugs would have been resolved by those tests, is what's happening. Uh, and then, um, another item that might apply here is automated builds. Um, so this is, um, so ant is for automated builds, and then down at the bottom that got cut off again is uh, continuous integration, which is something like cruise control. So Automated builds are basically anything automated that can compile your code for you or, um, or, dis or uh, distribute it, right? Um, so Ant is what I use, it's very common. Um, basically, you run it and it can be sure all the configurations the way that's specified. It's something you can check into source control, um, build it, and, and uh, if you've ever heard don't break the build, anybody heard don't break the build? So that's a big thing in my industry, right? So don't break the build means if you check in code and the automated build can't run because other people are using the automated builds. And even continuous integration, this is down here at the bottom. Anyways, continuous integration uh, is, is automated build on the server that's publishing the code for you. So um, I think yeah, t check out, just search for continuous integration. Cruise control is what I've used most. Um, so it basically means when you check in code into SVN or into the SV or SVN, you know, launch branch or whatever, um, continuous integration automatically recognizes, hey, that's new code. I'm going to run a build and put it up on staging. Nobody has to do that or push a button just because you checked the code in, right? And then what you don't want to do is break staging basically what don't break the build means. So that's, um, that's development process for me. Does anybody have questions 
on that. Yeah. Yeah, so what I do in single developer situations, um, I, it, it, like if I'm, if I'm doing a client project, I do use SVN. It's okay if you guys just as a standard don't have it available. I do use it on single development projects for clients. Sometimes on my own side projects I don't. Um, uh, and then, I would look at creating an automated build with whatever tool is um, most used. Uh, so .NET has an ant equivalent. I forget what it's called. Maybe Nant. I forget. Um, so yeah, look at setting up an automated build. Because uh, then instead of building it yourself, sometimes that can be a you know, dozen step process or something. You just double click a file. Uh, and you know if you broke it somehow. And so it's very useful. Um, and it can work, you know, you don't need all the complication of, of cruise control or continuous integration or deployment strategy or whatever to just have um, automated builds local on your box. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's my normal process. Um, you could look at, yeah, I mean, you could look at test-driven development, if you, especially if you haven't checked it out before. That's good to validate um, that you're not breaking stuff. So even if you use it after you wrote the code, you're sort of putting s stakes in the, in the dirt, right? You're sort of tying things down. And then if you, have, um, if you have regression bugs later, which is like you broke something and you didn't mean to because um, you were adding another feature, you broke this thing that used to work, then you know about it right away instead of three weeks later when somebody calls up because it's broken. Um, so those apply to, um, to single developer situations, I think. Anything else sort of uh, you had for me? Yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, it's not always easy. Um, so, so a few things that come to mind for me are if you're sort of in a silo like that, um, a big thing is validating your code because um, you're by yourself. Uh, so test-driven development applies. I think that would make sense if you want to validate your own code. And then also I would look at setting up a sort of peer review system um, and looking at code documentation. So um, that's something like um, we have AS docs and ActionScript or Java docs, but it's actually in the code comments that you can create a document from. So it's not like, it's not like oh, take a day and make an outline of, um, of the application because that'll be useless next week. You know, it doesn't really work very well that way. 
but when you put the documentation, just a line in the code above the method, this is what this method does. And then there's lots of automated tools to generate docs from that so that you sort of have a reference of what the methods are, what they do. And then as part of that, so don't, don't put like requirements around it, but just say, you know, look at documenting your code. Um, and then look at a peer review process. So it's not code review from like management, but it's peer review just so you can get other eyes on your code. You can look at other code. And um, what you're doing is, um, you're not guaranteeing that other people know the code, because that's not going to happen. But you're making a better likelihood that when somebody leaves code behind, other people can pick it up and understand what's going on. Because other people have seen it before and made comments, you know, maybe you could change this. Have you thought about? And it's basically that person that's writing the code has a months long ingrained understanding of the process that they've put in there. And somebody else can look at it and go, Shouldn't this be simpler? Um, you know, and try to fight to make it more understandable, basically. Um, any other questions? I have one back yeah. to the visual look and feel of your application that you're building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, so about half and half. Some projects have designers and some projects don't. And then the, there's, there's like half a dozen different kinds of design. So some designers are from a web background or from a print background, which is what design schools teach most. Um, so they're going to make it look pretty, but they're not going to make it work well. Um, and Part of design, interaction design, is making it so that it makes more sense for the user to use it, not just that it looks good. So um, yeah, you have to figure out a distinction sometimes with the client. OK, so I'm going to deliver you, um, you know, like the, the box model of how the application will work in code, and then somebody's going to like skin it, right? Or are they going to do interaction design and just give me designs, hey, make this? That's a different process. Um, but yeah, the, I forgot what the original question was. Does that answer it? OK. Yeah. Yeah. Well, knowing it's wrong is awesome. <laughs> That's normally the problem. Um, yeah, so I, I guess the, lo like, the loops aren't for, um, aren't for optimization. They're just sort of a, a result of whatever process created it, right? So yeah, the breaking point, I don't know. It, it's, I don't know if I have a good thought on knowing exactly what it is. Uh, normally, you can, so in languages, if you end up with warnings somewhere, normally those warnings are a good indicator um, that you could have a new function. So a lot of times, I end up with warnings for, say, duplicate variable definition. Um, so I, I make my variables very, I try to make them one word. I make them very plain. Um, so um, and then what happens is, is if I end up with two that really mean the same thing, instead of having, you know, alpha one and alpha two, I say, hey, why am I creating this variable twice in the same function? Right. That's sort of an indicator to me. Um, so sometimes you have a valid reason for nested loops. If you have like i and then j, if you're looping through columns and then rows or something, then it makes sense. But if there's a log lot of logic, in between, they're not like straight together, then, um, then probably you could 
put each one in a different function, so a function for each loop, and pass it the collection that you want to loop through um, would be a good start. I don't know if that's any help at all. But yeah, it's, it's, hard, it's sort of a process, and it may be language specific to know exactly where the good break, break points are, if that makes sense. Yeah, that peer review process is hard for the it's hard for the person reviewing too because the other the person that's used to the code is going to think it's just a walkthrough, right? It's easy to understand. Um, the person that is reviewing it is going to have to get up to speed in you know whatever is allotted, thirty minutes or an hour. So, um, but that that back and forth is is part of what's important for that process. I think. Uh, yeah, so it depends project to project. I, so I used to work more on subcontract projects. So this was, um, I would work for a development um, firm, I guess, on contract. And so they have larger projects because they can basically talk to a client and say, hey, you need 20 people to build this you know, app. They're a Fortune 500 company or whatever, and they can deliver that. Right, because I, I can't do that because I'm just by myself. Um, so on those projects, there's more of a process in place for design, you know, a defined design process and documentation process. So we may have time allotted um, for, you know, create documentation or, or create tests. Um, they, they have a process defined because it's a larger group. And there's, there's a process sometime, most, most of the time for design. So you know, but they might have some design on staff or contractors that are going to create a document, um, you know, talk to the customer, think through the problem. They just give you something, hey, make this. Sometimes that's good and bad depending on the result you get, right? Sometimes you get something you're like, I don't agree with that at all. But that's not your job at that point. You just have to make it. Um, you know, smaller clients. So in that process, a lot of the client management is handled by um, there's like management in place for that. So I don't deal with the client at all. I have the team I work with. We have, um, you know, a bug system, which I didn't mention, but probably not. Well, you might use it by yourself, but bug systems are nice. Just a way of keeping track of sort of your to do, not only bugs, but features you need to make and to do lists. And it's, for some reason, it's very um, rewarding. It's like self rewarding to just check stuff off. I feel like you got a lot done. Where even if you did the same thing and you didn't have a list, you're like, I don't know what I even did today. But I spent, you know, six hours on it. Um, so, so yeah, I'm not so much with the client. They're, you can tell they're involved because things keep changing. That's what happens when the client's involved. Um, on a smaller project, um, they don't normally have a good concept of interaction design or even that it exists. And what happens is the, the person who has the money is the interaction designer. So if it's a startup, the founder gives you wireframes, and they're not all, he's not always um, had experience to create good wireframes. So it's a process to try to say, hey, maybe we could do this. You're like trying not to say, this is a better way to do it, because I know, <laughs> right? Um, and sometimes it, it doesn't work, and you just have to take pleasure in the good pieces that you're building. Um, but and then they're very involved. So uh, smaller direct-to-client work, the client's overly involved because they're spending good money paying you. Um, sometimes it's not even their money. Uh, and they don't always have a good concept of what they wanted when they started. So it's growing over time. Things are changing over time. And you, in, like internally to myself, I sort of have a process of coping with the fact that it's not going to be the same when it ends than it, when it started. 
So that's part of keeping the code isolated too, because then you can change one piece. It's always changing. So that's part of why the code needs to be that way. Um, yeah, and the design process on that is, is messy. 